first, welcome to the series. And we are very grateful that you, and honored actually, that you've agreed to be interviewed. Um, and, and the point really is for you to do most of the talking, but just in case there's miraculously some person who doesn't know who you are, I'd like to introduce, you know, say a few words about you, and then I'll ask the first question. But first, we're particularly honored that you have agreed to be interviewed, largely because you bring a particular uh, voice to the field of the study of Christianity in China. And what's unique about your voice is that not only are you a scholar in the field and have published significant uh, uh, works, but you're also a passionist priest and an archivist who is the caretaker of this really wonderful passionist archive of materials related to the passionist mission. Um, and so you have this, 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 uh, this voice, both as someone who has uniquely connected to a, a significant uh, missionary enterprise in China and someone who has written quite broadly about the topic. I'm thinking of your contribution to the handbook of, of Christianity in China, uh, your recent uh, contribution to uh, the, the volume China's Christianity. And what's, what's also very fascinating, I think most people wouldn't even know this, you've written about Fulton J. Sheen's connection to the history of Christianity in China. And of course, I just looked at a database of citations. People are still citing your dissertation on passionists in Hunan, China. And then finally, before I ask the first question, um, you are working now on a monograph on Franciscans in China. And I know myself and other scholars are eagerly awaiting, awaiting that. And we all know just how complicated it is to write, to write the studies. But with that, with that introduction, I'd like to just ask you uh, the first question. And that is, what, what brought you in particular to the field of the study of Christianity in China? And, and really, too, if, you know, what brought you to the field and what drew you to the particular areas about which you've researched? Well, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Clark Anthony, um, uh, I think that that's a great question and it's a great way to start a discussion or a reflection on Christianity in China. When that I saw that that was the first question, the first thing I guess that really uh, jumped into my mind is archives. Uh, to me, it was archives and the basement of the monastery church in Union City, New Jersey, or in our whole monastery there, the church, uh, Passionist Church, you go down into the archives, and I went there, this was in the early 70s, and I had just uh, really become a young member of the congregation. I was still in religious formation, going through graduate school in theology, and I was taking a tour of the monastery, and someone in the basement said, oh, you should see this, you like history, you got a degree at Assumption College, this is where the archives are. And so I, I knew, I think I knew that the Passionists had been in China, but I didn't know that much, if anything. Uh, China was totally off the radar in the 1970s. I had never had a course in China or uh, Chinese history in college or anything. But I went in there and I was curious about the Passionists, but all I can remember is the archives smelled like cigars. The archivist there, Father John Francis Poole, smoked cigars in the archives. And of course, everyone knows that's against the rules. I mean, that's just wrong. But he said, oh, come on in, come on in. And um, he said, come on in, take a look around here. And I just walked in and I said, well, what's in this cabinet? He says, oh, this one, this is, no one really knows much about this. Pretty interesting though. And he starts opening up these file cabinets full of co China correspondence. And my intuition just said, this is really something quite amazing to me. So um, the first thing I guess that sort of struck me was all of a sudden I found this treasure trove of archives and I knew nothing about Chinese history. So to me, that was uh, sort of like a real invitation to sort of investigate, but how I was gonna do that, I didn't know. Uh, to get some of the dynamics of that from paper to research and everything, one of the things that really benefited me, and I think for younger scholars now, is they might wanna do research on China, but they do have a lot of people who have had, like you or I or other people, who have had extensive experience traveling to China. We are the, we're like the, if, 
if the missionaries in the 40s and 50s were the old China hands, we're the old China hands with the veteran people who know how to navigate this stuff. And I think, I think we have to be open to hear requests from other people and they have to be uh, bold enough and humble enough to ask us for assistance. And so what I started doing was I started going up um, to the old China missionaries that I was living with or ran into and I started to ask them some questions. But I realized that I was dealing with a delicate subject. And, and so, you know, I, I wrote down some names um, of some of the people. Sort of each one taught me something. I'm just going to mention a couple. Um, I'm not, you know, I'll be very succinct. Linus Lombard uh, was from Ipswich, Massachusetts. He went there in 1931. He was secretary to Bishop Cuthbert O'Gara. His big thing was when I started asking him about China, he said, let China love you. I asked him, you know, I want to learn everything about China. He pretty much laughed at me and told me, if you try to do that, it's going to kill you. So let China love you. Uh, just pick out something, investigate it. It's big enough for anybody, but always let it love you. So that was a very, very important aspect. Um, Marcellus White uh, was important to me. He was imprisoned uh, uh, as a passionist from 1953 to 1955 under the communists. And I went with him in 1989 to do research there. And he uh, told me that the best years of his life really were in prison in 1953 to 55. And the reason he said that was because um, he was taught all his life to trust in God and in prison he had to, and God pretty much came through. He was realized that it was a gift to be uh, in prison and to actually have that uh, and he let God love him and I thought that was a very powerful statement. Justin Garvey was also in prison at the same time in the same prison and he was a passionist from 1953 to 55 and together both of them really uh, took on an idea that reconciliation is the aspect even though they were both in prison um, and I they both taught me that reconciliation is the gift and the people are the gift. Uh, Cuthbert O'Gara was the bishop. I never met him. Um, he really was a strong anti-communist. He spoke at the um, rally before Senator Joseph McCarthy was censured in, uh, by the Senate in Madison Square Garden. He said the prayer, but he was a very strong anti-communist and, and, and racist actually in some of the ways he saw um, communist activity with blacks and spoke about this in the 1950s, but he was in China from 51 to 53. What he taught me <clears throat> is that when I started looking at the photographs, which I'll talk about later, that a whole personality came back that I had to change my first perception of him as a strong anti-communist to a person whose struggles, sorrows, and leadership had to face communism. And I've had to reevaluate his whole life. Um, Two more people uh, is Cuthbert uh, Cormac Shanahan, who visited Mao Zedong, and I'll talk more about him. But uh, he taught me to be surprised about China because he gave me his diary, and I'll explain that in a while. And then Casper Caulfield, who actually uh, did a lot of work in organizing the China collection. And, um, but as he wrote things about China, I helped him research. I gave him insight. We shared insight. But in his book, Only a Beginning, he doesn't give a reference to me on the article. And I challenged him on that. He did, I said, you didn't cite me. He says, well, I forgot. And I told him, you didn't forget. You purposely did not want to do that because you uh, and I differ on some things. And uh, I told him China's big enough for everybody, no matter what our issues are. And that was a very important learning lesson to challenge. And then I'll just go. Uh, very important. You asked me what got me going with was the archives and I think those human factors. And then the aspect about the people I wrote my dissertation on, there's three portraits that were in the Union City Monastery and they've moved around. They're now in Scranton at this point, but they're the three portraits of Walter Covio uh, uh, from Petoskey, Michigan, Godfrey Holbein from Baltimore and Clement Siebold from Dunkirk, New York and they were killed by bandits in 1929. Um, I wrote my dissertation on them. Uh, Covio always uh, 
reminds me that home support and prayerful support for the missions is important. Without support from home, there's no missions. Um, Godfrey Holbein really had a problem uh, in my mind of uh, adapting and culture shock and anxiety, missing home as a young man going to China. And he wanted to come home, but didn't because of time situation and time lag and he was killed. Uh, so unfortunately he represents the missionary who struggles in the field. And then Clement Siebold was sort of well adjusted. He, he did pretty well with the language. He stood up to his superiors and he said, you know, an event that's happening in West Hunan is not happening in central Hunan. So he said, people in Western Massachusetts don't care what's happening in Boston. And so each one of these people taught me this. So I guess it's the archives, the human stories are really got me interested. And then trying to identify these passionists who were murdered and sorrowed. Everyone knew them because they were dead. And I thought they were more important because they were alive. And so by researching people who are dead and finding out their importance when they're alive, you change the whole table around. It's not because they're dead, it's because they lived. And that's the purpose of history. And specifically in the China context. Right, well, you, th th this is a really rich answer and you've actually mentioned a few things that are related to my next question. But I wonder if you could recall maybe more specifically uh, a specific research discovery that particularly changed how you think about your topic. Yeah, I, I would have to say, um, uh, Anthony, that it, it's really the uh, the Shanahan, Cormac Shanahan diary. And what happened there was in the mid 70s, I went down to uh, Jamaica West Indies as an assignment uh, to work in Kingston, Jamaica and Christiana, Jamaica. And Cormac Shanahan uh, was there uh, as a missionary. And so uh, this was about 1970, uh, 75. And I had a chance to meet him and I had been interested in the China material. So I, I did what I said in the first part, I started taping him with a cassette tape. And he, I wanted to know about the 1920s because I was very interested in these murders of these men in 1929. And he was a priest there at that time. And so I kept asking him about the murders and he would go on cue to that. But then he started talking about Mao Zedong. And I kept saying, I don't want to know about Mao Zedong at this point. I want to know about the 1920s. And he was fine. And, uh, you know, eventually uh, I saw him over a couple of times and he was back a number of years later in the United States visiting his sister in Dorchester, Massachusetts. And I went to visit him and um, I was on my way to a family reunion in New Hampshire. And he, um, I stopped in to say hello and he said, oh, stop for tea, have for tea. And I wanted to get on to, um, you know, my family reunion. But I figured, okay, he's an older priest. I should probably have tea with him. You know, it's the right thing to do. And so I had tea with him. Then he wanted to say mass. And I really wasn't in the mood for hanging around for mass. But I said, you know, he's having mass in his home. I'll stay for mass. So I stayed for mass. After that was all over, he says, I have something for you. And he pulled out his drawer and he handed me a diary. I said, what's this? And it was an old passport um, booklet. He says, this is the diary I kept when I visited Mao Zedong in 1944. And I was shocked. I was totally shocked, totally surprised. And I said, well, what do you want me to do with it? He says, I don't know, but you're the only one that knows what to do with it. So I actually kept it in my room for a long, long time. Finally, I put it in the archives. And eventually, I think one of the things that changed my research about this was First of all, you get surprised by things. You don't know what to do with it. And you got to let it sit for a while. The second aspect is I began to transcribe the diary. So the details of sometimes research are very painstaking. It was in English. There wasn't really much Chinese and that was a good thing for me. But it had a lot of details that I really didn't know a lot about. It had a lot about economic aspects in Hunan, it, excuse me, in Yan'an. Uh, in, in, uh, Shang, up in Shangxi province there. Uh, and I, I was just looking at all these details and information on Catholics and at all these different aspects. And it was this pretty intense diary with fine point writing 
And um, it was hard to read, but very interesting to read. So I kept going through all these details and I finally got a, a draft of this, but I couldn't figure out, I knew he had been in Chongqing during the war as a reporter for Sign Magazine and um, was doing work there. But I couldn't figure out how he ended up on this trip with reporters. And only later, um, just by asking questions once in a while, that I found out that he was a writer for this magazine, The China Correspondent. Full run of it is in the Library of Congress. I found that. But this is almost 10 years later. And you can actually read this. It's in a 2007 article in the Verbeest article um, uh, out of Lubin Studies. There's a whole understanding of this, what I did. So if people want to read it, it's pretty interesting. But what I ended up doing was I ended up looking at that material, uh, put what I knew with the diary with the, the uh, magazine. Then I went into the National Archive aspect. I found out there was a footnote in Barbara Tuckman's book that mentioned Shanahan on, um, on Stillwell and the Mere Experience of China. Then I went into the foreign relations of the United States and I found that he was debriefed when he came out of his visit. And so then I went to the National Archives and then I found out on microfilm this stuff and this took about 15 years of work. And from there, I began to put this together and publish the article. But the second part and the third part of this research uh, idea that changed me is more recent because what happened is a scholar named Herbie Xiao, uh, who's at Guangzhou University at Sun Yat, excuse me, in Guangzhou at Sun Yat-sen University, she does uh, Chinese studies and she looks at journalism. And I happened to meet her in San Francisco. Um, and, and she said, I'm interested in that. And I showed her my article. And she says, this is very interesting. So she got interested in it. She invited me to, she wanted to look at it and I let her, she gave a project at the Ricci Institute from her point of view. And I said, you look at this diary now as a communist document. I've looked at it as a Western document. I, I said, you do it as a communist document. From there, after her presentation, she invited me and last October, I went up there to Yan'an as a the foreign expert and I spoke to the people on an anniversary of the, um, of the public relations and journalism at Yan'an. And I was the only foreigner there. And I talked about the diary. And one of the things I had to do was I couldn't say anything negative about Mao. So I had to learn how to reframe everything. And I kept saying, because it was a time of war, 1944. And then I put the facts in. So what I was able to do with this diary was learn how to research, see links that went besides a missionary idea to a State Department idea, how to actually give that idea to other scholars in China, trust them, get to China, understand this, give a presentation. And what I also did, which leads me to the second part of this research thing, which would be a little bit shorter than this diary, is I added digital photography from the Passionist China collection. And by showing and respecting photos of China that are important to them, they became so impressed. And they actually invited me back. I should be there now teaching about journalism in um, Xi'an. And the, what the photographs did was it reminded me, and all this reminds me, that this is not a story about Christianity or missionaries per se. This is a China story. We often forget that. Uh, you know, the reason we're saving this and the reason we reflect on this isn't necessarily self-serving for passionists or Christians or whatever. It's for Chinese society. And when we do that, it humbles us a great deal. And I showed, for instance, Ho Long, the famous bandit. If I said that in China, I would be sort of said, no, he wasn't a bandit. It was a, you know, party member. And I show him as a, a at attending a Catholic wedding in uh, Yuanling in 1924. So that they had never seen that before, that he was with Catholics. And so I think this digital collection actually, and this would be the last point on this question, is 
the diary made me a better researcher and surprised me totally. And I had to be open to that and, and expand my vision and think politically and diplomatically and everything. But the photographs reminded me that I started reading abundant letters. And by reading and looking at these photographs, almost eight to 10,000 of them, I had to change the part and realize that it's not just about what these men and women wrote, these priests and sisters, but it really is about how they looked and changed over a period of time from 1920 to 1950. And because the Passionist China collection is so rich, you could actually see the change over time as they aged, as they had excitement when they were young, as they were in prison, as they were in different locations. And this really humanized the letters in a profound way. And actually now it makes it more difficult for me to work without let with letters, without photographs. I find I'm bogged down. I wish I had a complimentary and that shows me how rich the Passionist collection is. One of the great things about that answer is not only do you richly talk about process, the process of dealing with the material, but you, you, you bridge this gap between working here in North America and being in China. So I wonder if you might now describe a significant or meaningful moment really in China, or I guess any place else, but something maybe that was significant or meaningful there while conducting your research or giving a talk. Well, I would say I would say the the big moment there I, was uh, going to the reburial of the Passionist gravesite in two thousand and um, um, four. I, I I was there in August of two thousand and four, and I had visited <laughs> excuse me West Hunan uh, a couple of times, and I got to meet the local Catholics. Now I was extremely circumspect, and this is something. Um, that I still was having a difficulty with, but um, I decided never to publish my dissertation as a book because it dealt with murders. And this was right after Tiananmen Square uh, that this took place. I was watching in 1989 all the events that led up to Tiananmen Square, I actually participated in the demonstrations in Hong Kong prior to Tiananmen Square, June uh, 4th. And, um, so I saw all this taking place and had interactions in Hunan. Um, I'd like to end if I want to just remind you with a story with Marcellus White. So if you can remind me to end with that, I think that's important. Um, but as I visited Hunan and began to look at the people of West Hunan, I realized the tremendous uh, experience of life that they had holding on to their faith. And I went there with Father Marcellus White and Sister Corita Pendergast in 1989, who was a Sister of Charity. And I gained tremendous respect for the suffering that the people had. So the first thing was the human idea that the Catholic Church um, had survived under these trying circumstances, but the people still had the faith. When the old Catholic women who were old at that time in 1989, visited Sister Corita and met her, they said, uh, which means, um, I've cried bitterness. And I knew enough Chinese, and my Chinese is not good really at all for a lot of things. And I would encourage people who want to study to do their best and keep learning whatever they can learn with the language. But um, I knew that, that what that meant. And I knew that that was just in one phrase, they captured, uh, you know, 1949 to 1989, they captured 40 years of experience. And they started to cry. So I was witnessing something that was extremely profound. And I, start, I just, I didn't do anything but just stand there and watch this. I mean, it was their moment, it wasn't mine. But eventually what happened was because I was there, they knew I cared, the Chinese people. And about maybe, you know, uh, maybe 12 years later, I got an email. This email became more popular and the people said to me, the local Catholics said, the government is redesigning the area of West Hunan in Yuan Ling, and they're putting a street from the water through the town into the main part of the city, and it's going to go right by through the missionary graveyard. Now, the missionary graveyard had been destroyed during the Cultural Revolution, so the 
the gravestones had been taken down, but the people knew where the bodies were, the graves. And so they said, we want to move the bodies, but we need the money to do it. We need the money from you as the passionists. And I said, wow, we have to do this. So there were, 50, uh, there were a total of 15 Western missionaries there um, from the Passionists, the Sisters of Charity Convent Station, the Sisters of St. Joseph of Baden, Pennsylvania, the Grey Nuns of Canada, and one lay woman uh, who was a doctor who had uh, German roots. So they were all buried there. They had died in the mission, uh, three of them violently from bandits, but the rest pretty much due to disease and natural causes. So I went to all the respective uh, congregations, my Passionist congregation and the others, and I said, let's divide up the cost of this, which was probably about 15 to 20 thousand US dollars, I guess maybe 10,000, I forget exactly the amount. And we'll split it up and I'll go over with the money and I'll pay them. And the they said, that's a good idea. If I recall the um, sisters of, uh, of the Grey Nuns, for instance, they, they were doing some work in their archives. And even I think it was the sisters of St. Joseph, they weren't sure who what the last names of the sisters were because they usually don't say the last names of the sisters. And I said, you need the last names of the sisters. I said, well, we don't know. And I said, listen, this is gonna be on their gravestone in China. You advocate as a woman's religious congregation that you have a voice in the church for women, find their last names. They're, you owe it to them, if not, you, you, you're just lying to yourselves about the role of gender, the role of history, and the role of religious life. Don't talk to me about clericalism. Find the last names. This is where they're buried. They gave their life for this. Get the last names. And they got them. And I was very, very adamant on that because um, sometimes in religious history, uh, what happens is you tend not to put the last names. And um, I think people have to really do their homework to figure that out. And that's a very, very hard thing to do. You know that, and other people know that. Of missionaries, they go by family names or, or nicknames. And the rigor of the analysis is their integrity of their family name as best as possible. I would say this, though. That whole story is important because what happened was when I went with the money, I had to figure out how to get that money to them without um, being um, upsetting to the government. So I was on a bus with one of the priests who was from the unregistered church um, who was with me and two, uh, two Catholic sisters of the charity, sisters of compensation and a lay woman. And we were all going to the uh, grave sites or the town of Yuan Ling from Changsha. And uh, I said to him, in Chinese, and he spoke a little bit of English, so it was a bus conversation. I had my dictionary out. I said, when do I give you the money? And he said, I'll let you know. I said, okay. So I had the money in my um, travel bag, and finally we go into this rest stop, and the food was pretty good. You know, it was a local place, so the food was fresh, it was good. He said, you can give me half the money right now. I said, right now? He says, yes. I said, where? He says, under the table. So I, I actually gave him half the money sitting halfway between Changsha and West Hunan and Yuan Ling under the table. And I said, when do I give you the rest of the money? He says, I'll let you know. And so I said, okay. So that was the first part. Then I informed the sisters. I said, you know, we can prepare a, a service because we'll be with the Catholics, but the government officials are going to be honored to be with us. So we might have to adapt because they might not let us say any prayers. I said, I don't know, but your job is to be polite. I'm in charge, you're not. And um, pay attention because I'm not sure what's gonna happen. And if I'm not sure, you're not sure. So I'll tell you what's gonna happen when I find out what's gonna happen. So we were there and um, as we were standing there at the grave site, I had a prayer and sort of a memorial service and the sisters were going to read something. And the government, local government official uh, from the religious affairs office said, it's so nice you're all here, but there's no prayers um, because 
this is just a ceremony for us to gather. So we, we know that you respect us and there's just no prayers. And I said, it's such an honor to be here. I well understand this. And I said, we're not going to be and say any prayers. So we will actually, in our own hearts, uh, say our own prayers and then just thank the government and everybody, the local Catholics, for allowing us to be here. And that's what we did. But the point is, we were there. And we were able to finance that gravesite, which is still standing there. And I would say the last thing was, where did I give the last part of the money? We went into the church, and as they had some people, some officials with us, and so the young uh, unregistered priest there said to me, you can put it in the collection box. They know that the people put donations in the collection box, so just put like the next 8,000 renminbi in the collection box. And you know they'll just think you're putting in money. And that's what I did. And that's how it worked. So that was a very um, powerful um, experience for me on, on how to negotiate uh, and take a research aspect, get other people involved, have a common purpose, rather than tell everybody they should do it. If you go on, if you use history to go on task to include as many people as possible and you uh, give respect to the local culture, chances are it'll work in some way. It might not work the way you exactly like, but it, it, it's, you're answering a request. So it's not necessarily your agenda, uh, but it's your assistance. And that's a very tangible way that uh, uh, I had an event that, was, that allowed me to use all my skills of language, history, what I had learned with how to handle government officials uh, from years of experience, and also, um, I think, bring a sense of reconciliation rather than set a sense of confrontation, which that could have easily done. I could have been very um, adamant and said, we've traveled all this way. And I said, you know what? This is not where the energy is. Uh, the energy is, you know, when I, you see a picture of Ricci in the background behind me, like friendship and, and respect for the affairs and the local Catholics. Uh, was the predominant thing. And we were there at a new burial site and they had never had the burial site before. They were destroyed in the Cultural Revolution. So what a great gift to be there when this was rededicated and to be part of that. I, I really like this story because for one, people I think assume that those who are, who are scholars who are writing spend all of their time in archives. And uh, there's so much more to any kind of life with researching China than being in an archive, especially when you're there. Well, one of the questions we've been, um, that, that has been decided to ask everyone, and that is if, if you might say something about someone else, about another scholar. So if you have a significant or a pleasant memory about another scholar in our field that you think is important to the history of our field. Well, you know, that, that, was, a, that was probably the toughest question. Uh, because as you get older, you realize there's a lot of people who have actually made a difference um, that have had an impact. And uh, for some reason, one of the things that really struck me was, um, I guess I had to go back to John King Fairbank. Uh, I never met him, uh, but he was an esteemed uh, uh, China scholar at Harvard. And one of his uh, students, uh, Jeffrey Kinkley, uh, uh, was at St. John's University in New York. But when Jeff Kinkley was at Harvard writing his PhD, this was around 1974, 73. Um, he went to the Passionist Archives because Shen Song Wen, that's who he wrote his um, a dissertation on, was a, a West Hunan a novelist. And uh, there were articles in Sign Magazine, the Passionist China Magazine, uh, that are the chat that had images and our correspondence that dealt with West Hunan and made the Shensong Wen novels came alive. You know, they tell stories there about little, and one of those stories of Shensong Wen, there's a story about, you know, little boys going to executions to watch bandit executions because it's so much fun. You know, is the body going to move when after the head's chopped off? And if the body moves, um, you know, that shows that that person had a strong heart, a strong spirit, but, you know, uh, they died a good death. And, you know, that was a big, big thing. And you see that happening when they have execution stories that they talk about in sign and in the correspondence. 
But Jeff Kinkley made me very much aware that this collection is more than just a religion story. This is a China story. So he and John King Fairbank would probably be one of the people who right away uh, made me aware that this is, a, this is better for a larger aspect that just hasn't have to do with preaching and gospel and that sort of aspect. And I remember one of that, uh, a number of years later, I gave a presentation at Loyola University at, um, in, in uh, LA uh, at the, uh, uh, they have had a lecture series in one of the aspects that really struck me, and I, this, I think this goes to the point of scholars um, who you thank, but in thanking them, you can also go back and ask them some questions if you wanted to. And my question would, would be, you know, if John King Fairbank had to rewrite his dissertation and go to back to graduate school now, what would he have to do? And I said, he'd have to learn about Catholic history. He'd have to go into the Catholic archives. All, all the people who do the Catholic history in the Catholic archives, they, it's presumed they know the Protestant story. And yet, um, in a lot of the major fields, uh, the challenge of, of people in the Protestant story don't always push people into the Catholic world. And I think that's something that is a bridge now that's sort of shifting. And I think where you're, this series that you're doing, Christianity in China, is a shift and helpful. But I would say, you know, those two scholars are really piqued my awareness very strongly. And Jeff King. Kinkley is still alive out in Portland, Oregon. He's retired, and I'm in touch with him. And he's always been a good friend and a, and a, and a real uh, advocate. But the major event, I guess, that, that I've always drawn energy from, and really was a deciding moment for me to go on and get a doctorate. I mean, everyone, everyone comes to a point where they said, I think I can do this. In 1981, there was an a international conference in Montreal, sponsored by the Camp Canada China program. And it was the first time that Protestant and Catholic leadership came to an international audience in Canada. Um, and they had Bishop Boutéchon and all these other different uh, leaders from the government. And there were only about seven or eight Americans that were invited. And because I had published in 1980 in uh, Catholic Historical Review, I got invited. I had published on the Catholic, um, um, you know, uh, missions, a passionist missions in China. So I got invited to this and I just listed, I went back and looked at the minutes of the booklet they printed out. And, uh, you know, the people who I met there and really got to know um, have really had a major influence. And what they combined was the idea of, of ministry and evangelization or Catholic theology on China or missiology on China with strong, hard scholarship that you can blend these stories together. And it's not just about gospel and baptism initiatives. It's, it's a, it's a gas with a, with a, um, in a Catholic national. And here are some of the names of the people who were there. Simon Smith, who was in charge of a Jesuit in charge of Jesuit missions at the time. We were sitting having uh, at the social, standing at the social, and he was speaking away in French. It was an international conversation. I could understand a little bit of French, but um, I said, oh, he had worked in Baghdad and with the Jesuits in Baghdad and um, was a biblical person doing biblical material, but now was in charge of Jesuit refugee services and was there because of China. And he said, oh, you know, oh, you, we somehow, we said, you should do a dissertation. He says, you should do it on the Jesuits in Baghdad. And I looked at him and I said, why would I want to do it on the Jesuits in Baghdad? You know, I wasn't even 30 years old yet. And I, you know, and I said, why would I want to do it on the Jesuits in Baghdad when I could do it on the Passionists in China? He says, then do it. He says, what's stopping you? I said, I don't know. I, I published an article. He says, then you're on your way. Just do it. And I said, well, I don't know. He says, if I had, if I had, Nickel for every Jesuit who said they wanted to do it and never did it, I'd be a rich man. Get your PhD. And all of a sudden, someone said to me, you have a whole topic here and presumed I could do it. And that really freed me that someone just did that. At the same meeting, 
was um, uh, also uh, Peter Barry. Peter Barry, who's at the Hong Kong Study Center, he was there at that time. It was there in 1981 for that meeting. He did the peer review article of my 1980 publication, A Catholic Historic Review. So he came right up to me. He said, that was a great article. And I said, who are you? I had never met him before. He says, I did the peer review on your article. And I had never even known what a peer review was. I didn't even know they did peer reviews. I mean, I know I got something back, but I really didn't know what the process was like. So all of a sudden I met the person. He says, that was really good. And he started telling me about different things. From then on, every single time I went to China and came out into Hong Kong, I met with him. And actually, when I've been there, I've played basketball with him, Peter Berry, and Cardinal John Tong, played basketball on Saturday afternoons. And John Tong is a great, great basketball player. And that's how he gets his exercises. So also there, not just Peter Berry, but Ann Gormley, a sister of Notre Dame de Namur, who was at the US Catholic Mission Association. And, and she was there because of all these missionaries. She was a, a very important and person and involved in that. Richard Madsen was at that meeting. And he, of course, is one of the premier Catholic scholars and you know, went on and did work in, um, in sociology. Um, Michelle Marcille, a Jesuit, was doing the translation. He, I became good friends with him. He was at the US Catholic China Bureau uh, for years. Uh, this is the people I met, Jerome Hendricks, who's still alive in Leuven, Belgium, um, and at the Verbeese Institute. He was at this meeting. Jean Charbonnet from Singapore, he was at this meeting, uh, who I got to know and meet there. McDonald McGinnis was at this meeting, a Protestant who was with the Merino Project. Um, also, John Paul Weiss, who actually has been a tremendous asset to me in encouraging me. What I realized by being at this meeting was that um, <coughs> I know that the passionist participation here and what I know as a young 30-year-old person has ultimate potential. And it's my obligation and my freedom to network with these people because they trust me to be here. And I also realized that the narrative was changing. The Chinese leaders there were telling us, they were giving a party line talk on missionaries as imperialists. And the scholars are starting to push back. Protestant and Catholic scholars all around the world were saying, this is not the full story. And I realized I was on the ground floor. This is, this is um, really 10 years or maybe five years before I went on even to start a PhD. And I should say that I got rejected for my PhD when I replied to Georgetown and Notre Dame. And it was because I wrote a peer review article that Jerry Fogarty from University of Virginia, a Jesuit, had the doctoral, had, had the secretary from the Department of History at Georgetown photocopy my article put it on the dean's desk and say, we want people to come and get a doctorate so they can write articles. He's already done that, let him in the program. And that's how I got in. And my point to that is, is don't think if you're young that you can't publish something, uh, do it. Because it could be the step that frees you. And if anything, it's your own self-satisfaction and your own self-poise. If you don't have self-respect for yourself in this, you won't have self-respect for others. And I think that that was a very freeing thing, that conference. I should also just mention before um, you can't tell me time is up, my dissertation advisor, John Paul, uh, John Whitech. John Whitech um, was a Jesuit and he was um, very, very intense. He loved footnotes, um, but he challenged me. And I think because he wanted a graduate student uh, uh, to deal with, aspects. But he said, oh, if you're going to do Chinese history, learn Japanese history too. And I just said, sure, okay. And all of a sudden, I was doing Chinese and Japanese history. But he was very, very aware that um, archival material and a modern China was a new area. And he pretty much said, get to work on this and let the, don't forget to footnote everything because the footnotes also was just important as the narrative. I would say that the last um, couple people would be Ed Malatesta and uh, Wu Xiaoxin. 
Ed Malatesta, a Jesuit, and Wu Shen. Without them, I would have never gone to the Ricci Institute. Um, they told me when they first met me that the 20th century was too controversial because anything after 1911 was just too sensitive. And I kept showing up there and everyone was polite. Wu Shen would bring me down to get something to eat. Uh, Ed Malatesta, you know, uh, was, you know, very kind and would, I would meet him at China Association meetings, U.S. Catholic China Associations, and he kept saying, stay with what you know, write about what you know, don't hesitate to write about what you know, that's your gift, stay focused on what you know, don't expand to other things, write about what you know, it's going to be an endless area, and so I did, and eventually he died, suddenly, which was he's only 62 years old, which is shocking to me, um, when he died. And um, I think what that realized for me was he was so supportive and, and, and really very generous um, and scholarly at the same time and, um, and, and a hard, hard worker. And Wu Shen was the same way. And, and so I was able to get to the Rizzi Institute. The other two people, are Joseph Lee from Pace University, Professor Joseph Lee, who, um, who really has taught me a lot from his practical experience about how to negotiate with Chinese people. I mean, you've done the same way, you and I have had conversations about that, but Joseph Lee would always tell me, he'd always start off by saying, don't worry, that's okay, that's the Chinese way of doing it. They're only officials. Uh, they don't really mean anything. Don't let the, they're, they're doing their job. He says, as long as you realize they're doing your job, you can do your job, but just realize that when the jobs class, clash, someone's gonna have to make a decision and you can still do your job in another way. I mean, that's basically what he's telling me. But he always gave me confidence to be involved and don't get intimidated by officials, even though it is very, very scary. And the last person, I guess, who has always been a very support to me, a person who's influenced me is Edward McCord, who's um, now retired, everyone's retired, I should be retired. He's, um, but he, uh, he's retired from G George Washington University and he's an expert on bandit and military history of Hunan. And we were at a conference and I asked him one time, uh, this was years ago, I said, do you know anything about West Hunan? He says, no, I don't. And he was a young person and I was still, I think getting my doctorate. And I said, well, I know this stuff. And I started to talk about the passionists of West Hunan. He says, obviously, you know about this. You are the expert of West Hunan. And we became very good friends. And we have worked together on projects before. And uh, he has always told me that stick with the Hunan story and the West Hunan story and, and, and keep drilling into the military and missionary story together because combined together, it's a stronger story than just a religion story. And if it's just military without religion, these the, the military historians and the secular historians have to keep going to your sources actually to find the complete story. So Ed McCord has kept that honest integrity of, of uh, diverse sources uh, before me uh, in, an, in an exhaustive way, and it, at times it has been exhaustive. So those would be the people I think who have influenced me and, you know, other scholars as well. And, uh, you know, even you to let me do this and invite me to this certainly has been very important as well. But those would be the answers I would give. So we have maybe five minutes left, <clears throat> but we're asking of everyone uh, what might seem like the sort of typical question you ask a scholar, and that is, uh, but I think an important one and a significant one uh, for this particular field, and that is what hopes do you have for the future of the study of Christianity in China? And then also don't forget to, to talk about um, Marcellus White. Okay. Uh, you know, I'm, <clears throat> I think, um, I think I'm very, very optimistic normally about this. I think you have to be. Um, to stay at this for such a length of time. But I have to say, what hopes do I have? I think my hopes are very sober, um, to be honest with you. Um, my hopes are measured. It's not that I'm not optimistic, but they're very measured. I think that they're measured because uh, I wonder how to be creative, and maybe this is my hope, that institutions of religion, religious congregation, or universities 
or governments like the United States government or the Chinese government can be creative and still be honest um, to, to look at the missionary story as a missionary story that reminds us of how, um, how sad we can be, how sorrowful things are, um, how honest we are, how people make mistakes, how people come into situations of war and catastrophe, how people enjoy life, how people, you know, we always ask what did the missionaries bring to China? And some of the questions I think that are hopeful to me is how do we in this process become Chinese? How did the Chinese who look at us and our sources become Western or American or international or uh, religious, um, even if they're not believers? Uh, how does that bridge occur? And for us, like, how do we become Chinese? So I think, I think what's hopeful to me in maybe doing this is, do I have enough stamina and enough resolve to keep raising my voice uh, as, as a way to, to accentuate that there's still hope of contact? The governments don't necessarily know what they're doing. The religious don't know what they're doing. But I think with the combined resource of scholars, government officials, people on the ground, um, uh, human rights advo advocates, business people, you know, again, there's a model that can be shaped. And I think it's the more we talk to one another. Uh, I, think, I think one of the things I wrote down is um, there are people out there who just don't care. And one of the things I would say is those are precisely the people we have to talk to. As soon as we get to only talk to the audiences that are going to be applauding us or um, giving us, you know, the honorariums or, um, or the students who don't ask the hard questions or don't want to do the research or the government official that stops us in the United States or in China, those are precisely the people we should be dealing with because that's really what it's about. It's, 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 a, it's a mission of humanity that has a re it so happens to have a religious experience. Um, and I think that's, that's a very important thing that I have hoped for. I gained this from Joseph Ho, um, from his um, looking at the digital material. That is a totally new world. I gained this from a woman who's uh, still, I believe, at Tulane University, Kaylee Bellback, who um, is, uh, was an orphan in China, was adopted by a family, as a freshman in college, she contacted the Ricci Institute and she wanted to learn about orphans. They've never had a freshman in college at the Ricci Institute, but she found it because of the Passionist Collection. And to open it up to undergraduates and young people who have the reserve and integrity and resolve to go with this is very invaluable. And I'll end with the story with Marcellus White. <clears throat> um, and this only recently came to me I never really thought of the story until um, I was here in our Passionist community preaching at the liturgy on Tiananmen Square, the anniversary, this, this, this June 4th, it's now June 12th, so a little over a week ago. And I would always, and I start always my class with the idea of let China love you, which is a powerful image. Um, and I had that in an America Magazine article, I believe in 2013. Uh, that's the article in America Magazine. But when I was with Marcellus in 1989, we were in Changsha at the Lotus Hotel, and Marcellus was partially deaf. <clears throat> and um, he was probably pretty close to 80 at that time, or his late 70s. And we were in the hotel, it was towards the evening, and um, I heard gunshots. We were up around the 12th, 13th floor, and I heard gunshots. And um, I sort of, woke him up and I said, Marcellus, there's gunshots outside. Now this is in, this is like um, like three or four weeks before Tiananmen Square. People are starting to mass in different cities and, and do these different events. And I said, Marcellus, there's gunshots. And he looked at me in the hotel, the dingy hotel room at the hotel. And he said, it's China, go back to sleep. And, and I thought about that. And I'm thinking, okay, you know, he's, he's been through this, you know, but when I thought about this now, you know, 31 years later, 
I said to myself, you know, I don't think I ever went back to sleep. Um, yeah, you know, I picked my challenges, but anyone who, who wants to look at China, you know, everyone might think as you're a scholar that you're sleeping and you're lost in the archives and you, you pick your fights wisely, but you don't sleep. You know, you don't go back to sleep. You stay awake and you, you catch your rest, but you stay vigilant. And um, I think what Marcellus White told me was, you know, you go back to sleep so you can wake up again and do your job and go up into the streets, go back to the archive staffs, you know, write your manuscript, you know, care about the Chinese people, uh, say the right thing at the right time, listen well, be patient, um, connect with people. And I think, you know, um, that's been a real gift to me. Right. Thank you so much. That is a particularly moving story. And I think something that, uh, that is good for scholars to hear, to remember that the, it's not, they're not just a topic, it's a people and it's a friendship. Well, I should say thank you again so much for uh, agreeing to uh, share your thoughts and especially that story about Father Marcellus White. With that, thank you. And we, uh, everyone who's working on this project wishes you a very good summer. So with that, thank you so very much, Father Carboneau. Well, thank you. Uh, Anthony, very good to have be with you.